My name is Dr. Nathaniel Frederick. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Mass Communication. And welcome to News Literacy and the Future of Journalism. The News Literacy and Future of Journalism series is an eight month, 11 event collaboration between SC Humanities, Winthrop University, and SC Press Association. Additional support comes from the North Carolina Humanities Council, the Museum in Washington, D.C., the John C. West Forum on Politics and Policy, the Departments of Mass Communication and Political Science, and the College of Arts and Sciences at Winthrop University. The News Literacy and Future of Journalism series is part of a national initiative on democracy and the informed citizen, administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and funded by the Mellon Foundation. This initiative seeks to deepen the public's knowledge and appreciation of the, of the vital connections among democracy, the humanities, journalism, and an informed citizenry. The name of this program is is, is that all you do, the art of editorial cartooning. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. We have a survey, a feedback survey. Log on to your mobile devices, to the link there, and to the QR code. And I'll also uh, bring that up later on in the program as well. Also, if you have any questions, if you, when you walked in, you should have received a green uh, piece of paper here, write down any questions that you have, and at some point uh, during the program, uh, those will be taken up and read. Now for the introduction of our speakers. Our moderator is Terry Plum. Terry Plum is the former editor of the Herald in Rock Hill, a paper that has repeatedly that has been repeatedly recognized for excellence, including awards for public service and freedom of information from SC Press Association. Robert Ariel is former editorial is a former editorial cartoonist for the state newspaper in Columbia, South Carolina. His work is published in over 600 newspapers through United Features Universal Euclid Syndicate. Ariel has won numerous awards for his work, including the South Carolina Press Association Award for Cartooning and the United Nations Ronan Laurie Political Cartoon Award in 2009. Kevin Sires is the Charlotte Observer's Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist, creating five editorial cartoons each week and writing the occasional column. A native of Minnesota, he has been drawing for the Observer since 1987. So I hope you all are prepared for an engaging program, and I now turn the program over to Mr. Plum. Um, before we get started, uh, I want to point out that the title for this evening's program, Is That All You Do?, uh, was suggested by Dwayne Powell. Dwayne, who is an editorial cartoonist for the Charlotte Observer, um, had, had to... It's for the Raleigh News Observer. Raleigh News Observer, excuse me. I get, they were both my enemies, so I didn't, I didn't get their names to do. <laughs> um, anyway, he, he had to drop out because of, of health issues, and Kevin uh, very graciously agreed to take his place. Uh, but the title uh, came from a book that uh, he did, uh, and, and the, the fact that it, it is, is that all you do, uh, I think points to a very sensitive issue with the, both gentlemen here. Um, we're blessed to have uh, such excellent uh, professional uh, editorial cartoonists here. Uh, and they both had a unique perspective in that they were the cartoonists for the largest newspaper in their respective state. Uh, the Charlotte Observer and the state in Columbia. And over their career, stretching several decades, they had uh, occasion 
to comment on some of the biggest stories that we've had in the Carolinas, including uh, the fight over bathroom access and gender identity, uh, Mark Sanford's infamous Appalachian Trail hike, uh, the near collapse of the U.S. economy, taking down the rebel flag from the State House Dome in Columbia, and the fall of Silent Sam in Chapel Hill, uh, as well as Hurricanes Hugo, Floyd, Florence, and Michael, just to name a few of the topics that they've covered over the years. In the next hour or so, we, they will have an opportunity to expound on those subjects and the cartoons that they drew and why. But more important, we encourage you to engage them in discussing the role of editorial cartoons in the current media landscape and their expectations of how their profession can help achieve the goals of the news literacy and future of journalism initiative that you had explained to you a few minutes ago. So what we're going to do is have each of these gentlemen in turn show you some of their work uh, and they will discuss these cartoons as they go. And after they both have had their opportunity, we will then open it to questions. I've already prepared some questions to sort of salt the mind to get it going, but we welcome you uh, to submit your own questions and hopefully we'll have a lively discussion. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin and he will let you have it. Okay, thank you. Uh, as was mentioned, I've been at The Observer since 1987. I've been cartooning down here for 31 years. This is an example of my <laughs> uh, If you guys have been studying this at all, you probably this is actually uh, Ben Franklin's early work. This is a cartoon by Benjamin Franklin uh, at the time of the uh, Revolutionary War, uh, advocating, of course, that all the colonies need to get together Fight for a common cause. Um, and it's credited as being one of the first editorial cartoons published in America. So editorial cartooning has been around since, uh, since America has been around. It's been a vital part of our democracy. Sorry about that. Um, As you can see, what, what, what he's done here is taken a symbol and, and, and he's telling his opinion through the use of symbols. The snake cut up in pieces. The theory was that, that snakes can rejoin. You know, if, if they don't rejoin, they die, but somehow they can, they can form themselves back together again. It, he was a great political philosopher, but didn't really know much about science. But, <laughs> but, but, so, but you can see that this to get the idea that you know, we need to be an independent nation, you know, this was a, a piece of advocacy. This was an opinion, this was a call to action, and that's what a lot of we do as editorial cartoonists. You know, when you look at the newspapers, uh, the front pages are all supposed to be objective, they're supposed to tell you, you know, both sides, they're supposed to give you a clear picture. You get to the back of the newspaper, it's usually in the back, is what they call the opinion section. And that's where newspapers feel that that those pages are a, a meeting place for the community to share ideas, to share opinions, to talk about the future of the nation, the future of your community. And cartoons play a big role in that because, because it's, a, it's a great way to express an opinion. It's a shortcut. Um, you can read a long editorial and they go on and on, one hand, on the other hand. Well, with an editorial cartoon, there is no on the other hand. It's just Within eight seconds, you've to the He refined Uncle Sam, sort of made Uncle Sam the image that we all recognize. This was an, an image he came up with. 
uh, that cartoonists still rely on. Next one. And likewise, Thomas Nast invented the Republican elephant. And like I said, cartoonists still use those symbols. Am I doing that? There. How's that? Okay. Next slide. I'm just going to yell. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, next slide. Next slide. So there's the Republican elephant on top of Donald Trump's, Donald Trump's hair, uh, burning at the stake. So this is a quick, a, a quick idea that, you know, the cartoonist, moi, thinks that Donald Trump is uh, going to damage the Republican Party. Um, hmm? going, to. going to, right. Well, <laughs> this is from 2015, so that was, an, that was an early version. And it also shows you kind of the way cartoons have changed over time. Uh, Thomas Nast's day up through the uh, turn of the century to the 1930s and even into the 1960s, cartoonists were still big on just symbols. They would draw a giant and label it the deficit or some such thing. Um, but but with, in the 1960s, starting with, uh, well, in the 50s with Herb Block from the Washington Post, Pat Oliphant, uh, also for Washington DC papers, uh, Jeff McNally, Bill Malden, Doug Marlette, Mike Peters, cartoonists got more into what's called satire. And satire, you might have heard from one of your freshman English classes, is, you know, where you kind of, you tell a lie to get at the truth, um, Jonathan Swift was the, is the famous example of this. He wrote this, the, England treated the Irish so bad that, that Swift said, you know, you might as well just eat their children. And it was called A Modest Proposal. And he, he wasn't really serious. He didn't really think the English should eat the Irish children. But, you know, you get the idea. If things are so bad, you might as well do it. And so that's, and so that's an example of satire. And cartoonists... I think the, the best cartoonists indulge in that a lot. We, um, we exaggerate, we reduce things to absurdity. Again, it's all in the point of advocacy. It's in the point of trying to tell our viewpoint of things, trying to get people to act, trying to get people to, uh, to see things in a new way. Uh, by, by the humor of the idea, the, the symbolism, kind of creates a shortcut of ideas. And, and I like to think of it more as like when... when my bosses write an editorial. I kind of like to do a cartoon on the same subject. I like to think of it as a one-two punch. Uh, the, the, uh, the cartoon can hit them, shake them up a little bit, and then the reasonable editorial can maybe convince them once and for all that they should change their minds about something. Next slide. This is an example of my early work. I did this one shortly after coming to the Observer. This was at the start of the first Gulf War. And uh, everyone that I was listening to on the radio and on TV, they were pretty gung-ho for the war. They wanted to go in. They wanted, uh, I guess, using the troops was the same as supporting the troops. Um, and, and time and time again, I heard that people were saying things like, like people who want peace are, you know, just out of it. You know, they, they're, they're really denigrating the idea that there was a, a peaceful way to handle all of this. And so I came up with this cartoon. And... Even though this cartoon is from 1991, it's still probably one of the most controversial cartoons I ever did for the Shattered Observer. I have a hard time matching that level of outrage that this cartoon provoked. Um, and part of that is because, because of the use of sacred symbols. And, and you know, people hold these things dear. They, they mean something special to them. Um, what I've found out over the years that that everyone has their idea of what's sacred. You know, it's not just you get in trouble for drawing pictures of Muhammad. Next slide, please. You get in trouble drawing pictures of football players, too. <laughs> this is something I did back when Cam Newton was still kind of working on his style and, and hadn't quite perfected his, uh, 
his approach yet, but he still liked to pull his shirt open even though the team was losing, so I kind of called him on hot dogging. But <laughs> this cartoon also caused a lot of controversy. Stephen A. Smith from ESPN came on TV and started ranting about it. And you just can't please anybody these days. I don't know. <laughs> Football is sacred. Uh, here's another symbol, symbolizing the President of the United States uh, as standing passively by, not, uh, not understanding what's going on, saying it's not, you know, not my fault, I didn't know about this, other people are doing it. Um, this is not the current President of the United States. This was actually one of the cartoons that I won the Pulitzer Prize for back in 2014. This is a cartoon about President Obama. And which gets that to the other thing. People, people tend to think that cartoonists have to be on one side or the other. You know? And I will grant people and they say, well, that cartoon was really unfair. I say, yeah, it, it is unfair. That, thank you. That's what a cartoon is. It's, you know, because you're, you're cutting to the chase. You're not saying on the other hand. It's unfair. But I think it's truly only unfair if you're not willing to do it to the other guy. You know, that's... You, a, a good cartoonist looks at a critical eye at both sides, all sides, and, and f needs to call him when he sees him. Next one, please. This is another symbol. And this is also President Obama. Uh, he actually said that, mm -hmm. so that he couldn't help but draw the lemon. <laughs> Next one. This is Obama on uh, the Jay Leno show. Come on, Mr. President, you're on the Tonight Show. Say something hilarious. We don't have a domestic spying program, uh, which we did. Uh, this was also in my Pulitzer Prize portfolio. And I like to bring that up because I get a lot of email these days. You, go, you never made fun of Obama. How come you're always making fun of Trump? It's like, I did make fun of Obama. You just have a short memory. <laughs> Next one. This was uh, after the Charlie Hebdo uh, thing, and, and, and I thought Obama's response to it was terrible. Uh, he wouldn't go overseas and join the other foreign leaders uh, calling for free speech. Uh, but everyone, everyone was wearing these buttons that say, Joshua, Joshua Charlie, uh, I am Charlie. So he is Charlie as well, but he, of course he was Charlie Brown. <laughs> Next one. And this was one I did on his efforts um, to get a gun control bill passed. Instead of yes, we can, it was yes, we can't. And the C-A-N-T stood for the, the school shootings at the time, Columbine, Aurora, Newtown, and Tucson. And that was also, I, I actually think, I had a lot of on gun control in my portfolio, and I think maybe that's one reason uh, I won. I don't know. This was after the, uh, this was after, speaking of gun violence, this was after the shooting in Charleston, South Carolina, in the church. And I just, I felt like I had to say something dark and important, and that's, that's how that turned out. The passage is from the Psalms. How long, O oh Lord, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Next one, please. And as a result of that, Nikki Haley and the legislature took the, the flag down from the State House grounds. But there were still a lot of uh, racist State House memorials in both South Carolina and in North Carolina. Uh, the voting restrictions, the photo ID bills, underfunded schools, the wage inequality, the Medicaid cuts, the racial profiling that was going on. So the, the Confeder I was saying the Confederate flag is, is an easy thing to get rid of. All of these are still out there and much, much harder to take down. This was uh, Amendment 1 had passed in North Carolina. They actually did a uh, constitutional amendment outlawing gay marriage. And so I thought of this, this great couple, Liberty and Justice, Miss Liberty and Miss Justice, being expelled from North Carolina because they couldn't stand uh, these kind of couples being around. So this is a, this is a takeoff of a Michael, Michelangelo painting of Adam and Eve being driven from the garden. So it was liberty and justice being driven out of North Carolina. Uh, the legislature in North Carolina has a super majority. They, can tr they have a veto-proof majority in both houses of, of the legislature. Uh, Governor Cooper was elected uh, as a Democratic governor of North Carolina, the Republican legislature uh, quickly passed a series of bills taking all his power away from him. So he's, 
he wasn't, you know, North Carolina always had kind of a weak governor before, and now it was really weak. So the, the torch has been passed. There's a famous line from John F. Kennedy's memorial. I thought it was appropriate in this place as, as the governor took office. The other thing uh, our state legislature leader did was pass the uh, infamous HB1 bill, saying that, uh, that people had to use the bathrooms that the government decided they could use and not let themselves make up their own minds about which bathroom they needed to use uh, because people might be afraid of you know, seeing someone's anatomy. And this is at the same time that they're also, so this is a, Charlotte had passed a non-discrimination law and, and so the state legislature passed HB1 in retaliation of that. This is the same time they're also trying to take over Charlotte City Airport. So that was, that was my response. Your anatomy makes me feel unsafe. This is very early Hillary Clinton cartoon as she was starting her run for president. The email thing came up real fast. And this was her response when people were trying to uh, call her out on it. I fully complied with every rule that I was governed by. Uh, I guess she just governed herself. <laughs> This has always been one of my favorite Trump cartoons. Um, and this gets to the other tool that cartoonists use. We, we, love, we love symbols, we love metaphors, we love satire, but we really love caricature. To draw someone to... Uh, everyone is funny looking, I'm sorry. <laughs> but. But the, to, take the, to take that and make a point out of it, uh, it's, just, it's just the kind of thing that keeps us going all the time. Um, this obviously, the, the, the bill of the ball cap uh, transforms Trump into Richard Nixon. And with the, the collusion thing and the scandals, uh, making a reference to Watergate. Uh, we don't just... I don't feel anyway that we caricaturize people just to make fun of how they look. I, again, all, all editorial cartooning is a form of communication. We, we have an idea, we want to get that idea across as quickly as possible, so it really works well to draw someone's caricature in a way that gets across what you want to say about that person. Uh, Nixon, for instance, was uh, round-shouldered, very beady eyes, very dark brows scowling. Um, he actually became the face of political corruption. He had five o'clock shadow anyway, and as his term went on, it got darker and darker and darker. Uh, Trump is, is a, a man of appetites, of uh, being unreflective. Uh, I think every cartoonist is in a challenge to draw him heavier and heavier, uh, his mouth more and more gaping, his lips more and more protruding. Um, just to get that, that, that rapaciousness uh, across, that this is a very carnal human being without much thought or reflection. Um, next one, please. <laughs> Another caricature. <laughs> um, I think that one comes across pretty, <laughs> it doesn't need much explanation. <laughs> This, this one was a challenge because I really, when I read that quote, again, it's another actual Trump quote, I, you know, I just, you got to do the puppet thing, right? But, but hand puppets, ventriloquist puppets, it's all been done before, what's a new way to do it? And I just thought with, with the mouth and everything, I just, that just works so well, the shape of the head. I, I was so pleased with this. <laughs> That's my hand, by the way. I, I was drawing it while I was doing this. Next one, please. <laughs> this is the uh, very recent uh, aftermath of the disappearance and now murder of Jamal Khashoggi, who's the Washington Post reporter that the Saudis lured into the consulate. I just heard driving down here this afternoon that they found his body today. Uh, Trump was very eager to make this story go away, to excuse the Saudi behavior, almost to the point where I felt he was he was being complicit in a cover-up. And this, 
the image refers to a, his last trip to Saudi Arabia where he had uh, King, uh, King Solomon's in the middle um, and there was, some, there was some orb that they were all fascinated with. It was a kind of picture that went viral from about a year ago where they all had their hands on this glowing orb and looking very pleased even though the orb apparently had no purpose except it was decorative. So I just thought I'd change the orb into the skull and, and just try to convey my, my, I guess my grief and my indignation of how I felt about our president's behavior with all this going on. And, and see, that's a, another thing that editorial cartoonists do. We're not, we're not just cold-blooded, you know, like, like we take some kind of news quiz and decide where we need to come out on the issues. I mean, everyone, everyone's working from their gut on this, a lot of this. It's really, really gut work. And, um, and I, one comment I get all the time, actually, you know, speaking of Dwayne's book, I actually did get that comment. One of my neighbors came up to me and said, is that all you do there? Because, you know, this, this should, you know, you draw these little pictures and then you're done, but it takes all day to think of what little picture to draw. But uh, another comment I get a lot of is, boy, you must be loving this. There's something every day, every hour. Man, this is great. Trump's just feeding you guys so much stuff. And all I can think to say is, yeah, but, you know, cartoonists get sad, too. <laughs> I don't know how much more of this I can take. <laughs> Next one. Um, and this is a sad cartoon. Um, we had the Keith Scott shooting in Charlotte. Uh, and then there was, uh, in other parts of the country, police officers were, be were, police officers were being killed. And uh, it just seemed like, you know, we needed to have a conversation, but we were not having a conversation. And, and part of it is, is no one can get past their own grief to even know what to say to each other. So... That was my, how I tried to say that. And I think this is the last one coming up. This was, again, indignation about the uh, pedophile priest scandal and the Catholic Church's response to it, which seems to be, let's just hope it all goes away soon. <laughs> and and I th they did say, you know, we're, we're, we're praying for forgiveness, but we'd like to see m less prayer, more action. I guess that's with a lot of things. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, you will note when uh, Robert talks, that, and some of his cartoons will be on the same subject, so it will give you an interesting comparison of how these two very creative people took a different approach to the same subject. Robert? Thank you, Terry. Is it on? Can you all hear me? I'm a South Carolinian and a South Carolina cartoonist, so uh, I use the symbols of our state quite often in my cartoons to make a point. Of course, you, you take the, the iconic flag of South Carolina and then twist it somehow and change it and to create a new meaning. And in this case, I'm talking about all of the out-of-state trash that was filling our landfills and creating new landfills over the years. Uh, it's one of the ways that poor South Carolina could make a living. Our politicians years ago decided that we would be the receivers of trash of all kinds from all over the country. And this was just dealing with the landfill problem that we have. Next, please. Another problem is low-level nuclear waste that's been coming our way for quite a, t a while. In this case, I use the shape of South Carolina to form the side of the green box where the garbage is being distributed or, or deposited rather by the rest of the United States. Next please. When they found the Hunley I thought this was a good opportunity to make another jab at, uh, at uh, Senator Thurman because real ex Strom because you know he was around back then He's, he was always with us I think. Sometimes I just go for the gag, because <laughs> I like to make people laugh if I can. Next, please. And here's using another icon, uh, another cartoonist uh, work, but to make a comment about uh, the South Carolina and the Confederate battle flag. And I think this, in a way, kind of sums up 
our uh, need for the flag or some some of our some of the people in our states need for the battle flag it was a uh, you know it was a a, a comforter it was uh, uh, couldn't give it up uh, of course we finally did with uh, we had that horrible shooting down in Charleston and uh, Nikki Haley, Governor Haley uh, bravely stood up and uh, and made a move that uh, nobody else dared make but uh, they finally brought the flag off the state house grounds before you know it had been up above the Capitol dome flying in a position of sovereignty which was completely wrong the compromise brought it down to the uh, to the uh, ground level but it was kind of in our in our face at that point it was right at uh, South Carolina's front yard on Gervais Street and Main Street it was very uh, visible at that point but we didn't think we'd ever get it uh, removed but that was the impetus the uh, shooting in Charleston that uh, finally we got it off of the state house grounds which I think is a good thing next please here's another use of uh, uh, the flag symbol to make a point I drew this when Hurricane Hugo hit the state in 1989 and uh, used the surplanted the uh, satellite image of the hurricane for the crescent on the flag and of course the tree is bent and uh, we made posters later that raised uh, thousands of dollars for Hurricane Hugo relief down in Charleston and I put a title on the bottom of the poster this is the way it ran actually it ran in black and white back then I wasn't using color then in 89 but uh, we we added a, a, a title bent but not broken which I think kind of added to the meaning of the flag that in the, the the palmetto tree that represents the, uh, the South Carolina the resilience of South Carolina that we, we we took a beating we bent we were bent but we didn't break and we were coming back so trying to say something uplifting uh, that we might come back from when we did next now we all remember Governor Sanford's Appalachian uh, Trail hike. Uh, the thing is, who knew the, that the uh, the southern route went all the way to Argentina? And uh, in in this case, I added his two little piglets, pork and barrel, to go along with him. You know, he had he had uh, uh, infamously brought them into the uh, state house where they defecated all over the floor and on him and uh, as well. He was trying to make a point about pork barrel spending, but it kind of backfired on him, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> Next, please. You may remember seeing a, uh, an image similar to this uh, at, at John McCain's funeral. You know, Lindsey Graham, Senator Graham, was uh, McCain's uh, right-hand man. He was his wingman. You know, they were anti-Trump together. They were the Mavericks, but so quickly, Senator Graham has <laughs> sidled up to Trump. He's his new best friend. And I just thought, what would McCain say? And so I said it here for him. And quit sucking up to Trump. Next, please. Birds that could be harmed by offshore drilling in South Carolina. The sandpiper, the heron, the brown pelican, and the goose that laid the golden egg, which is tourism. And as I pointed out earlier talking about this the uh, uh, the amount of money that we can possibly make from offshore drilling off of South Carolina is a drop in the bucket compared to the billions of dollars that are brought in uh, through tourism and we better think long and hard about drilling off of our coast uh, particularly with the uh, the new news that there's been an ongoing leak in the Gulf of Mexico that's putting out five to seven hundred barrels of oil daily and has been doing so for 18 to 20 years and it's been covered up that's the same sort of thing that possibly could ca could happen to us and I think it would decimate our tourism industry and you know among others uh, the fishing and, and whatever else uh, they're having a lot of problems in the Gulf and I wouldn't want to see that happen here in South Carolina next when gas reached four dollars a gallon I drew this cartoon and you see this in ingenious dude here decides to take down the numerals and creates a bicycle that he can ride away on this is one of those sort of international style cartoons that doesn't use a lot of words and uh, is easily understood in 
you know, across uh, nations. In fact, I got a lot of email from around the world in languages I couldn't <laughs> decipher, but apparently I think they all liked it and, and it got a lot of response. So it's one of those kind of cartoons that went viral. The international style is the, the you know, without, without word balloons, without labels or as few lab labels as, po as possible is something I love to try and do, but it's, it's very difficult. It's hard to make your point without having to add a few labels in there. So I, it, when, when I can do it, I, I enjoy doing that. Next, please. Now, when Bill Clinton came out with his memoir, they had the problem of deciding uh, where to put it. Would you put it in fiction or nonfiction? Or maybe in the depends on what the meaning of fiction is uh, uh, category. You remember the me what, what it, the meaning of is is. That's where that comes from. Next. And here's a takeoff on Benjamin Franklin's uh, original first American cartoon. And in this case, I'm using the, the imagery, but I've changed it a little bit. Again, taking a, 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 an iconic symbol and twisting it a little bit to create a new meaning. And in this case, I'm talking about the U.S. energy policy. And we need to join all of the different uh, parts of it to, to, to have a successful U.S. energy policy. So domestic drilling, coal, new refineries, hydrogen, fuel efficient vehicles, nuclear, wind and solar, and conservation should all be part of a, an energy policy, I, I think. And that, of course, this was done years ago. I think now a lot of people want to get away from coal or clean coal as President Trump calls it. And one more uh, note about the, the, um, the segmented snake. I had read uh, years ago that, that, and there's always a backstory. Uh, and, or a lot of times there's a backstory to a cartoon that gives it kind of gives it more meaning or, or fills out the meaning and in this case I read that there's a, uh, a popular mythology of the time of the late 1700s that you could reanimate a snake by if you cut the head off you could put the head back to the body uh, before sundown and it would reanimate and come back to life. And I think that that is probably what he was getting at when he drew the segmented snake. That there was, based on that mythology, you, you know, people understood what he was talking about. That, yeah, we, if we put it back together, it, it will live and survive. Next. Now, a lot of times I like to use the politicians' own words to make a point. In this case, President Obama, in talking about Obamacare, said, trust me, I'm not trying to cram this down anyone's throat. And the elephant saying, it's a suppository. <laughs> Next. And then last year when the uh, Harvey Weinstein uh, incident really kicked off the uh, hashtag uh, Me Too movement. I mean, it had been around, but that really set fire to it. And it, the wildfire ran all through Hollywood first and then on to journalism politicians and everywhere else. Uh, it, it has spread everywhere. But this was my initial take on it. Called it Harasswood. Next. I call this Twitter feed. <laughs> President Trump has been shown to lie daily. Um, and, you know, I don't know that he does it on purpose. I think sometimes he does it on purpose. I think he just says whatever's on his top of his mind and it just comes out. But nevertheless, uh, and he dispenses them through his, through his tweets. So there he is feeding them lies. Next. And here's a, uh, an old meme of the, you know, the big fish eating the little fish eating the little fish. Only in this case, it's the plastic pollution in our oceans that is devouring the other fish and it's a major problem uh, in South Carolina as well as in the Pacific and the Atlantic all around the world we've got to get a handle on this uh, plastic pollution because it just doesn't go away and I think it's going to do great harm to our environment and to mankind too if we don't get a handle on it next please these are birds of a feather enemy of the people this one drew a lot of uh, a pretty negative response from Trump supporters, uh, you know, and initially I can understand why. You know, I'm comparing them to these mass murderers, horrible tyrants 
uh, from before, but the impetus for the cartoon originally, I'd, I'd known that, that Stalin had called the press the enemy of the people. And then doing a little research, I came across a few references where it was also uh, Hitler and Mao Zedong who also called the press the enemy of the people. They, they, um, they called anybody that got in their way the enemy of the people, but the press was a big problem, the free press in particular. So that's what I'm making the comparison to. Not that Trump is like them in the, in the way of a, being a mass murderer or anything like that, but in the, in the sense that he wants to shut down the media. And, and so I, th I think in that case, it's a fair comparison. Next. I call this one the shepherd. It's the ongoing Catholic Church pedophilia scandal and cover-up. And here the, the, uh, the shepherd is the wolf over, taking care of his flock. It's just horrible. I think it's going to totally, if not destroy, it's going to completely transform the Catholic Church. Next. And this is my last one. I did this for Newspaper Week a week or two ago. Here I have Jefferson, who actually said this. This is a paraphrase, but basically what he said. Given a choice between a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. To which Trump said, loser, sad. <laughs> I'm, really, he was tweeting that, but I had to put it in the way that he, he could read it. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 I think it really points out how he, he deals with the, the press in this country, and it's a shame. I also should point out that uh, Je Jefferson made this comment before he was president. And I, I found this out, you know, in researching, but I'm not going to let facts get in the way of a good cartoon. But, <laughs> but when he was president, he had a different feeling about newspapers because <laughs> they started pillorying him. Uh, for this and that. So he wasn't, wasn't so keen on them after that. But that's, that's my last one. Thank you. Uh, it may be best if we share this mic because it seems to be the one with the less feedback. Um, if you have questions, uh, please put them on the green card. Raise your hand and, and there's somebody in each aisle to pick them up and we'll bring them down and, and answer, uh, ask your questions. In the meantime, uh, I've got a few of my own. I thought I'd start off with a softball. Uh, mainly, how did you get started with editorial cartooning, and who may have inspired you along the way? Kevin, you want to go first? Um, I just always had a compulsion to draw. Uh, it was just something I did. As far as editorial cartooning, um, my family was, my dad was big in the unions. I grew up in the northern Minnesota iron mines uh, area, and my dad was a, a union guy and, and into the union politics, and so we had a lot of discussions. Hubert Humphrey was sort of a patron saint of our family. Um, and, and editorial cartooning was just sort of a way to combine both those interests of, of drawing and and, and politics. If I, if I hadn't become an editorial cartoonist, what I really wanted to do was draw Spider-Man. But uh, this, this worked out for me. Uh, I was working in the mines myself, trying to make some money to go back to school. And uh, there was one of the economic downturns, and they laid off a lot of the workers, and you know, first hired, first fired kind of thing. So I got laid off and was collecting unemployment. And a friend of mine ran the weekly newspaper in my hometown. And so I came to her and I said, you know, if I did some cartoons, would you publish them? And she said, sure. And that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And so just kept working to see how I could do that. As far as inspirations, I mean, her block and, and, and Oliphant, as I said before. And um, the work of Doug Marlette that Charlotte before me was, was an inspiration. And, then, and also just my coworkers at The Observer, uh, the editorial writers, had been through so much Southern history, and, and both in, in their growing up and in Charlotte politics, that it just was a great way to, uh, to approach journalism. I, I, like Kevin, I always loved to draw. I mean, from the, from the beginning, I was always doodling on something and drawing this and that. And, my mother was concerned 
that I would become an artist. So she, she um, urged me to go into architecture, which I wasted four years of a five-year program before I decided I didn't want to be an architect. I didn't want to draw straight lines. I wanted to draw crooked ones. And so um, <clears throat> I started... Uh, uh, I started working at the school paper and uh, uh, one thing after another and I actually realized I could do this for a living and it beats work I tell you that I, <laughs> and in, in today's environment we have so much material to work with it's a gracious plenty although like Kevin said it can be well with Trump it's it's um, it's it's tiresome <laughs> I want to get off of Trump sometimes but he he takes all the wind out of the news cycle it's always about him. I'd like to move on to other topics and I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to be mindful of that as I do these cartoons and get away from them once in a while. And my my inspiration were also the cartoonists of the day. I think Pat Oliphant and Jeff McNally were two that uh, I was inspired by and uh, looked up to when I first started. Uh, one more question for me, and then we'll uh, go to a uh, question from the audience. Uh, during the October 2nd program on fake news versus the real thing, Professor Real pointed out that one interpretation of fake news is news coverage that may not be technically inaccurate, but, but, but reflects the bias of the reporter or the newspaper. Giving that interpretation is it what you do pretty much a textbook example of fake news? No. <laughs> I'm not a newsman. I'm an editorial cartoonist, and there's a big difference. I'm giving my opinion uh, and advocating for a, a, a particular position. Um, I don't intend that you agree with me, although I would like you to. But uh, that's the nature of what we do on the editorial page. I think Kevin said this earlier. And uh, so, so there's room for editorializing. It's when I think a lot of fake news comes from when, when uh, a, the, the newscasters or the writers who should be more objective in their delivery of the news inject their opinion. Then that, that can cross over a little bit. But, but what Kevin and I do is is cartooning and it's not I don't think it's in the realm of what the newsroom does Kevin you like to add to that yeah, just a little bit because yeah Bob is absolutely right we're not we're not reporters we're we're opinion mongers and, and as I said before newspapers have always had an opinion function the editorial pages of a newspaper are a place for the voices of the community and Bob and I are just a couple of people in the community that can draw. <laughs> and, uh, but um, the real definition of fake news, I mean, Trump is, himself has admitted this, is news that the president doesn't like. I mean, it's, it's negative news. It's not advocacy news. So um, I, I, I think that argument's a little bogus. <laughs> but. Okay. Ready for a question from the audience? All right. <laughs> and what did you do to get here today? Okay. Um, there's, there's, this, there's a million ways to become an editorial cartoonist. Um, I was just at a, an editorial cartoonist convention uh, in Sacramento a few weeks ago and and everyone there has a different story and a different approach and a different history uh, some people studied art and and they are fantastic artists other people uh, are English majors others are political science majors uh, it's basically um, having something to say and then understanding the art form enough to be able to work in that medium and one thing that helps is find an avenue to get published. And now with the internet, that's become much easier. Uh, there's, there's not many cartoonists like, 
Robert and I working for newspapers. And in fact, there's, there's less cartoonists working for newspapers now. Uh, but what, what a lot of the young cartoonists are doing, and a lot of the people I met out in California, are, are working uh, and being published on the internet. Uh, and and you, you should check out, if you're interested in, in becoming a cartoonist, check out their work. Uh, one place a lot of young cartoonists are getting their work published is this thing called The Nib. Uh, look that up. It's kind of more long form satire, but some wonderful stuff is being done. Um, other people are approaching it through the use of graphic novels, uh, different kinds of comic strips. It's, I mean, it doesn't help to learn, I mean, it, it helps to learn to draw. And I, to ask how I got, I, I spent a lot of time just drawing and trying to teach myself to draw. I, I was not an art major. And and I also got a job on the student newspaper at the University of Minnesota. And, and that was sort of a great training ground because I, I did five cartoons a week there. And, and, but that's just my story. Like I said, there's a million other ways to do it. And Bob's probably got some different advice. Robert? Uh, I don't really have anything to add to that. Nothing to add. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll go to another question from the audience. Um, what was the single most controversial cartoon that you can remember drawing? Well, there have been several. <laughs> and I'd rather not go into it. <laughs> I did one recently um, that dealt with uh, uh, teen angst in the, in the age of, <clears throat> of uh, the hashtag Me Too movement that I think reasonable people understood the meaning of it. It was like a dating couple both thinking whether... The guy thinking, should he kiss the girl? And she's going, what's wrong with guys these days? You know, doesn't he like me? And I didn't mean anything you know, nefarious about it or dark. But boy, it lit a fuse. And a paper that ran it up in Illinois uh, is a college uh, town, Champaign-Urbana. And uh, apparently the, the whole kerfuffle, um, I, I spoke to the editor and publisher. I... I contacted them. They didn't contact me. I saw what was happening, and I got a flurry of emails and really horrible, nasty uh, kind of thing that um, that uh, nobody wants to receive. And uh, <clears throat> I took it on my... I don't work for these people. They just ran my cartoon out of... Uh, uh, because uh, I'm syndicated, to, and they, they, they're one of my clients. But I wrote them a, an email to tell them, you know, this is not at all what I meant by this cartoon. I'm sorry it's causing all this trouble. And they said, well, can we run it in the paper? And I said, well, sure, if you, you know, edit it to make it look like a, a, a letter to the editor or something, you know, just stating my position. And they ran it. And then there was just even another outrage, you know, saying, well, that's not what you meant. We know what was in your mind kind of thing. It's just, and when, when you get in a position like that, people can take, cartoons can evoke emotion and, and outrage like nothing else. And uh, you just kind of have to ride out the storm. But that's happened to me. And, and this is an, an instance of a cartoon being interpreted not at all how I intended it to be interpreted. And uh, that's happened uh, three or four times in my career. And <clears throat> I, you know, that's not the sort of thing I want to happen. And I hope I, uh, am, you know, I, I think very seriously about what I do every day because I want to communicate the idea that I want to get out there and uh, so when it when it backfires like that it's uh, it's it's not fun to, to be on the receiving end of all, all that uh, negative e uh, emails Kevin do you want to add anything well I just had one more example um, I showed a couple that were quite controversial the football player and the and the the Jesus cartoon, but another Jesus cartoon I did, uh, probably got the most controversial, was a Billy Graham uh, crusade was coming to Charlotte. And again, I was reacting to the commentary and the letters to the editor that I was seeing. And um, so I drew a cartoon of this couple with their hands clasped and their eyes towards heaven. And they were saying, oh, we're so glad that Billy Graham is... is coming to Charlotte, and we're finally going to get a glimpse of Jesus. And as they're walking down the sidewalk, they're passing a homeless man in the doorway looking very sad who was the image of Jesus. 
And, um, and people did not take kindly to that. <laughs> not in Charlotte, I, guess, I wouldn't think. Uh, the next question, uh, where do you find inspiration for your cartoons? And what happens when you can't come up with an idea? You draw a really bad cartoon. <laughs> um, inspiration is just, I mean, it's the news. I mean, if you're a thinking human being and you pay attention to what's going on, you're going to have some reaction to it. And, and so cartooning, is, it's, it's, it's sort of like blogging in art form. If you've got something to say, you f figure out a way to say it. And, and I spent a lot of time... One thing I tell students when I'm talking to the class, they want to know how to draw a cartoon. I don't sit down with a blank piece of paper and draw a cartoon. Those days I'm really blessed. I'm, you know, my first cup of coffee in the morning, I'm reading the paper, and something will just spring wholly formed into my mind. But most of the time, it's just covering paper with scribbles. And, and working till you find that image or that composition that, that makes it happen. And, and it takes a while. Robert? What was the question again? Where do you find inspiration for your cartoons and what happens when you come up with an idea? Oh, that's right. Uh, I have not had the problem of having a, uh, uh, not coming up with an idea. Uh, in a long, long time, and I, I guess I think it's like anything else. The more you do it, uh, the more accustomed you come to it. And with the news, like Kevin said, it just falls in your lap every day. <clears throat> so I have to make a decision: Am I going to do this cartoon about Trump, or this thing, a local issue, or or this environmental thing? You know, there's so many uh, issues out there, and I, my problem is deciding: Okay, what am I? What direction am I going to go today? And Usually, it's based on uh, what is topic A. You know, you want to, whatever the big issue of the day is, I try and cover it if I can. If I spin my wheels and I'm, I don't really feel like I have a good idea on that, I'll pass that and go to something else. But uh, it's been a long time since I've had a, uh, looked at a blank piece of paper and not been able to come up with something. But like Kevin said, you, you sit there and scribble and jot down ideas and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that that you know until until it starts forming and then and then I might do 20 or 30 sketches before I do uh, the final uh, drawing and it, and it changes I change the composition I work on the dialogue uh, and it just it it's a every, and I think everybody has their own method to do that but you just you, you keep working until you get it done Earlier, earlier today, uh, Robert spoke to uh, some classes at Winthrop, and uh, I learned something that, that I wasn't aware of. And the question was, uh, do you have a meeting with your editorial board to reach consensus on an idea? And Robert's idea uh, answer sort of surprised me, so I'll let him answer that question. Well, <clears throat> early on when I joined the state newspaper in the early 80s, uh, uh, I made the point of, of talking to the editors and because when I came in, you know, I was new to them. <clears throat> there, there had been a cartoonist at the state newspaper 75 years earlier, but so it had been a while. So none of them had any experience working with a cartoonist and I didn't have any experience working with editors. And I guess they thought they were going to have this, you know, cartoon by committee and they were going to supply me with ideas. And I just said, look, this is... I'm putting my name on this cartoon, so this is more like a signed column. This is not a, uh, a, an unsigned editorial that's done by committee. Uh, so, you know, if, if it's my idea, I'm putting my name on it, it's going to be, uh, it's be my idea. And, uh, and they said, okay, and, uh, and it worked out all right. And um, I guess uh, uh, another question that came up was, you know, do you, have, do you ever use somebody as a sounding board? And, uh, I used to quite often, in my last editor, uh, he was very good at uh, looking at a cartoon and telling me, if, you know, what did it need, if it needed anything. <clears throat> but since I was laid off back in 2009, I, I had to learn to just trust my gut, and that's what I've done. And actually, I think my cartoons have improved because I just go with my, you know, what I think is best for them now. And I don't rely on anybody else's opinion to, to form them. 
in the interest of full disclosure, he did say that he shows them to his wife. So let's let's get that straight. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, I just I want. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about Rob Rogers, who was the cartoonist at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, who got fired, um, and and he's put out a a great comic strip about his experiences as an editorial cartoonist and his uh, his adventures with his publisher, who ended up firing him. But there was a couple panels that I I, I just I just thought were so marvelous because it speaks to the evolution and the growth of an editorial cartoonist. Like like Robert, I don't uh, I don't show my cartoons to anybody. I do my cartoons. I show them before they go into the paper. I say, here's, here's what I did today, and my editor can either approve it or not. They always do. Um, but, but Rob did this, this panel where he talks about when he started out at the, at the Pittsburgh paper, his editor would just write herd on him, and, and there's a panel of his editor saying, these cartoons suck. A six-year-old could do better. And, and then Rob says, and as I matured, I... I became to be a pretty good judge of my own work. And there's a picture of Rob looking in the mirror saying, these cartoons suck. A six-year-old could do better. <laughs> so that's, that's sort of how we grow and, and learn. Uh, I'd like to elaborate on that. He uh, wrote a piece, as Rob Rogers said, that he was fired because he was too harsh on Donald Trump. And when you read between the lines of his column, what happened was the ownership of the newspaper changed. And he was slow to pick up on the change or simply uh, did not want to go along with it. So he did lose his job because of his uh, independent stance on, on a controversial subject. The next question is really comes in two parts. One is sort of a broader uh, career type question. The other was a little more um, in, in the weeds here. Um, how are political cartoons uh, faring in the digital age of journalism, which was one of the questions I was going to ask, and uh, if so, um, uh, which program do you use to create the cartoons? Software, comma, or question mark, hardware. So uh, go into it as deeply as you wish. Well, I, I still draw cartoons the old-fashioned way. I do pen and ink on paper. And uh, then I, um, I scan them using a Wacom tablet. And I use Photoshop, but there's some other... Um, software you can use, I believe, uh, but I, I only, one's enough for me, because <laughs> you could, in Photoshop, you can do the same thing a million different ways, so I just tried to find out how to do it one way, and I, I stick to that, but I do black and white cartoons, and then I scan them, uh, so I have a digital version, and then I add color, because that's been a big thing since about the last nine years, uh, everybody wants color in the cartoons because they're running more and more on, online. And what was the question about the... Uh, uh, how, how are editorial cartoonists faring in the digital age? Well, um, not too well. But, I mean, you, we, we can be seen by, you know, a, a greater magnitude of uh, people now uh, with the Internet, but monetizing that is a big problem. Uh, there's, there's no way to make a living. You can put it out there, and people can see it, and you can, you know, get uh, a lot more hate mail or maybe fan mail. But uh, but it's hard <clears throat> if you're not with a newspaper, if you're not syndicated through an organization, it's hard to make a living doing it. Kevin, I don't really have anything to add. Uh, back to to yours truly. Uh, earlier, uh, Nate recited the the goals of this whole program, News Literacy and Future of Journalism. Uh, the goal implies that one of the essential ingredients of an effective journalism is an informed citizenry. I note that several of the cartoons we saw here tonight uh, seem to presume that there is a degree of intellectual sophistication uh, on the part of the audience, or at least a basic awareness of current events. I'm thinking of the cartoon that Robert showed of the nuclear waste bin or the one of Mark Sanford on the Appalachian Trail with the piglets, which are two separate issues. Or um, Kevin's uh, cartoon of the angel driving the Statue of Liberty um, out of the Garden of Eden. Um, and Or the one... Um, 
that showed um, Richard Nixon's silhouette uh, shown against Donald Trump uh, and his hat. Now, many of the people in this audience were probably not alive, certainly they're very young, uh, when cartoonists around the country, all they had to do was do that little swoop before Nike came along, and everybody knew it was Richard Nixon. Uh, not sure that, that the younger uh, generation would know that. But so my question is, uh, how do you view your audience, and how important is it that we have an informed citizenry in this country? Uh, well, that, that, that's sort of a gimme. I mean, without an informed citizens or citizen, citizenry, um, we're doomed. <laughs> Uh, so, and that's and, and that's why I think journalism is so important. I mean, to some extent, there's there's another old joke about uh, the cartoonist at this newspaper heard that all the journalists were getting raises, and he walks into his publisher's office and says, "Well, am I getting a raise? Aren't I a journalist?" And the editor says, "Well, is a barnacle a ship?" Um, we do sort of, follow, you know, a, a lot of guys in, in, in the Charlotte Observer newsroom will come up to me and say, that was a great cartoon you did. And I said, well, I did that cartoon off your news story. I couldn't have done that cartoon without you going out there and finding that stuff out. So it was a great story. Don't, you know, the cartoon came easy. It was the story that was the important thing. And, and I, I, I feel that about a lot of the reporting that's being done these days. The reporting is essential. And the advocacy, the discussion comes after the facts have been established. You know, it's, uh, it's journalism's role to figure out what's going on. What do we need to know? And then we can have a discussion about what do we do about it. And I feel like that's what the cartoonist participates in. So I think an informed citizenry is in vital to what we do and it's in vital to the fate of the country. Robert? Well, we have no more questions. Uh, I think that this has been a very stimulating evening. I want to thank everyone for attending and your rapt attention. I want to thank our two esteemed editorial cartoonists for taking their time to be with us tonight. So I'd like to give them a final round of applause. Thank you all for your attendance this evening. I want to remind you to uh, take a couple of minutes and do the survey, all right, uh, if you haven't already done it. And I also want to remind you of our next program uh, next week, and I'm going to switch to that very quickly here. Uh, oops. Do opinion writers matter anymore? And that's next Tuesday. So take a quick picture there, our next program next week. And I'll go back to the... Right. And I'll go back to the uh, survey there. Take a couple of minutes. If not, see you later. Thank you very much.